Welcome, everyone. I'm stoked to have Dr. Matt Cableine back on the show to discuss two papers he's recently co-authored. So the first one is titled, Once Daily Feeding is Associated with Better Cognitive Function in Health and Companion Dogs, Results from the Dog Aging Project. And the second paper is titled, Anti-Aging Diets, Separating Fact from Fiction. So welcome to the channel. Thanks, Brad. So let's just go through what the Dog Aging Project is, just in case people didn't see our last uh, podcast. Sure. So the Dog Aging Project is a large-scale longitudinal study of aging. And, and what I mean by that is that, that our goal is really to follow uh, as many companion dogs. So these are all dogs living at home with their owners throughout as much of their lives as possible to understand what are the most important genetic and environmental factors that influence health outcomes during aging in dogs. So um, it's longitudinal. And what I mean by that is that, that we will be gathering information on these dogs at multiple points throughout their lives. Um, that includes owner reported survey data, as well as some uh, laboratory uh, samples from, from veterinary visits um, and veterinary health records. So that's the largest part of the Dog Aging Project. It's about 33,000 dogs enrolled in the longitudinal study right now. And then we also have a smaller clinical trial aimed at testing whether or not the drug rapamycin can impact aging and lifespan in companion dogs. Fantastic. So what did this paper show? So really what the paper showed, the take home message is that in our cohort of dogs and in, and in this particular study, it was about 23,000 dogs, I think, um, dogs that were fed one time a day compared to dogs that were fed more than once a day seemed to be at lower risk for a variety of different age-related health outcomes. So we looked at, I think, 10 different uh, health outcomes associated with aging. And in all of them, the dogs that were fed once a day had a lower risk. And for seven of them, I think the, uh, the decrease was statistically significant. So I think it's important to say up front, this is a correlation, right? And correlation does not equal causation, but at least within our cohort, there was this pretty strong association where feeding uh, a dog once a day was associated with lower risk for multiple age-related health outcomes. <clears throat> Fantastic. So one of the things that seemed to be the primary endpoint, if you like, uh, was this thing called the Canine Social Learned Behavior Survey. So right. what is that? Right. So this is a, a survey instrument that has been uh, validated in veterinary medicine as predictive for a disorder called canine cognitive dysfunction, which is basically the, the dog version of dementia. Um, we're actually trying to understand to what extent does canine cognitive dysfunction actually mirror Alzheimer's disease in people. That's a little bit of an open question, but I think it's pretty clear that, that it's a, a, a very similar sort of disorder to dementia, generally speaking, in people. So this survey, the Canine Social and Learned Behavior Survey, is a validated tool for diagnosing dementia in dogs. And it's, it's based on uh, a small number of questions that owners answer about their dog's behavior. And based on this, the total score from that survey, if the score is above 50, that is uh, thought to be uh, a diagnostic tool for dementia. And it, it matches pretty well with what a veterinarian you know, uh, would diagnose as dementia. So that's what I mean by validated. What hasn't been shown yet, although I think, I think our study is indicative of, is whether or not this survey instrument can be used as a continuous tool. And what I mean by that is um, previously it's always been binary. A score higher than 50 is diagnostic for dementia, a score lower than 50, is not diagnostic for dementia. Um, one of the questions that we're interested in is it, at scores lower than 50, can this be used in a continuous way to predict cognitive function? In other words, lower scores would be indicative of better cognitive function. Higher scores, maybe in the high 30s, low 40s, may be indicative of a decline in cognitive function that goes along with aging. We didn't actually, we did actually show that data in the paper, although we didn't make a big deal of it. It turns out that it really does look like this survey um, is pretty good in a continuous fashion where we see very strong age associated increases in score, which again would reflect potentially lower cognitive function. Um, and it looks, you know, more or less like a, a, a logarithmic function. In other words, on a semi-log plot, the scores go up linearly with age, which is what we see for other age-related diseases. So, so we really think this probably is a pretty good continuous measure of cognitive 
cognitive function. Now, in the context of this specific paper, what we asked was, you know, was there any difference in score on this survey associated with once daily feeding versus more than once daily feeding? And it turned out that, that indeed dogs fed once a day on average had lower scores on the survey, which, which is probably reflective of better cognitive function. So I can hear people uh, on the channel asking how should we interpret this in terms of humans? Because as you know, how did you try and adjust for different things that, that could affect cognition in these dogs? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, as is always the case with these kinds of observational studies, we should, we should be cautious in our interpretation for humans. And, you know, maybe to take a step back, it's, it's interesting because I think the other paper we're going to talk about is this review uh, that we recently published on, on anti-aging diets. And, you know, these two projects actually are, are really tightly linked. So the whole question of looking at feeding frequency in dogs as a, as a measure of health outcomes really only occurred to me because I was in the process of starting to write this review and diving into the literature around time-restricted feeding and intermittent fasting. So, so in the process of writing that review, um, it, it occurred to me that we had the potential in this, this canine population to really look at uh, was there any relationship between feeding frequency, which in dogs being fed once a day might be a canine model of time-restricted feeding and health outcomes. And so we, we set out to do that study and we found, as we've already discussed, that there seems to be a relationship between once a day feeding and better health outcomes in, in companion dogs. So the first thing I think we should say is we're not recommending anybody change the way they feed their dog, let alone themselves based on this study. Um, although I, I think the data are quite compelling and interesting for future studies. Um, so we did try to control for, for you know, covariates that, that might be influencing the relationship between feeding frequency and health outcomes, body size, genetics, so, so, so breed of dog, um, uh, uh, body weight, things like that, that you might, you might expect to be related. Um, and still these signals came out, right? So I think that, I think there is definitely a true signal there. You know, what's unclear to me is whether or not there is some sort of trivial explanation. So the one that I always gravitate immediately towards is, you know, maybe dogs that are fed once a day are less likely to be obese. So we could look at body weight, but we don't have in our survey data, we don't have information on whether the dog is actually obese or not. You could certainly imagine dogs fed once a day are less likely to be obese, and that might be why they're healthier as they get older. I think that's a plausible explanation that we need to, to follow up on. Um, another one could be diet quality, right? Which we also didn't have information on. Um, so you could imagine that, you know, for example, owners that might feed their dog a raw food diet are more likely to feed their dog once a day. I don't know if that's true. I'm just saying you could imagine that's the case. Whereas dogs that owners that feed their dogs, you know, commercially available kibble, maybe are more likely to let their dog eat as often as it wants to, or feed three times a day. So those are the kinds of things that we couldn't control for that. I think we need to look at in follow-up studies to really try to understand, is this a, is this relationship a feature of time restricted feeding, or is it, you know, some other secondary uh, effect that is associated with dogs that are fed once a day. And we just don't know at this point. And this is, this will get, you know, this will be important as we dive into the human uh, world as well, right? Where I think, you know, a lot of the literature on time-restricted feeding and these other so-called anti-aging diets either come from mouse studies or they come from studies in obese people. And, you know, what is the real evidence that these dietary strategies are beneficial in, you know, dogs or people that aren't obese, that's, that's, a, that's less clear to me. So when it comes to adjusting for different factors that, that may have influenced the outcomes of this dog aging project, one of the things that, that struck me um, is, did you adjust for the wealth of the owners? And why I ask that question is that there's quite a clear correlation in humans that the wealthier a household is, the better health outcomes they, they have. Yeah. So I don't think we did in this study. Um, uh, honestly, I left a lot of that up to the statistician. I don't think that was one of the things that we adjusted for in this particular study. We do have that data and we're certainly aware of that. I think maybe it, it won't surprise you to learn that even within our sort of overall longitudinal study cohort, we tend to be pretty enriched for 
uh, people of higher socioeconomic status. And that's a, that's a limitation in our study that we recognize and we're actively trying to develop strategies to recruit dogs from, from households that are, are underrepresented in our cohort. So, but this gets back to the more general point that I was trying to make that, you know, things like diet quality, for example, you might expect to be better in households of higher socioeconomic status, both for the people and for the dogs. And certainly that could play a role. So these are the kinds of next level things that we want to look at, you know, as we dive into the, the data a little bit deeper um, to try to understand really, you know, are there substantial differences in, in diet quality or maybe other aspects of the animal's lives that are associated with once daily feeding. I don't think we have any reason at this point to think that um, households of higher socioeconomic status are more likely to feed their dogs once a day. If anything, my intuition is it might actually go the other direction, but I, I think we just don't have any data on that at this point. Yeah, I was kind of thinking that if, if people are wealthier, maybe they're working longer hours um, so, so therefore once a day, but her, yeah, Could as be, you say, yeah, I think it's an interesting question. Yeah. We'll just yeah. have to, we'll have to look and see. I don't know. Yeah. So what is the presumed say, if this is a true effect, and, and I know that this is speculative, what is the presumed mechanism for how once a day feeding may improve health outcomes? Right. So this is a really interesting question. I think there are, there are probably several potential mechanisms you, you could point to, um, uh, so I already talked about what I think is probably the most likely, which is that dogs fed once a day are less likely to be obese. And we know that obesity puts people and dogs at higher risk for a whole variety of different age-related diseases. So I think that's probably the simplest explanation, but you could certainly um, speculate about, you know, potential mechanisms that tie into the biology of aging, which we haven't gotten into yet, that could be at play. So one obvious place where people's minds might go is ketogenesis, right? So this idea that when we fast, our bodies switch from primarily burning carbohydrates to fat. And one of the consequences of, of primarily burning fat is the production of ketone bodies. That's what ketogenesis refers to. And so, you know, the whole idea of a ketogenic diet is exactly this, right? You, you, you consume very few carbohydrates, that causes the body to switch over to primarily burning fat as a fuel. You, you, you uh, produce ketone bodies, and then those ketone bodies actually get into circulation and can be used by other tissue. So ketone, ketones are primarily uh, formed in the liver, but then they can travel through the circulatory system to other tissues like the brain in particular, where they can be used metabolically. There's a lot of uh, thought that there are benefits, benefits associated with, with burning ketone bodies, as opposed to burning glucose as a, as a primary fuel source. So we know that fasting is enough to switch people and mice over to ketogenesis and produce high levels of ketone bodies. So it's tempting to think that might be what's happening in the dogs. The problem with that, and this is where we haven't looked in our dogs again yet. The problem with that particular model is that in dogs, it's my understanding at least that it takes dogs a few days to actually produce high levels of ketone body. So while I really like that model, um, I don't think we have any reason to think that once daily feeding in dogs is going to produce high levels of ketone bodies in the blood. It probably will in people, again, depending a little bit on what you're eating, but uh, I don't think that's likely to be the case in dogs. So that's probably not the explanation um, in this particular, uh, this particular study that, that we did. Yeah. So on that point of, of trying to shift this into, you know, how can we influence our own health? One of the things that, that I often talk about at length on my channel is the evidence pyramid, where right at the top of the evidence pyramid in, in human trials, um, you've got Cochrane reviews. And there was a 2021 Cochrane review that was published um, in January. And essentially, they wanted to find out if intermittent fasting or, or once daily uh, feeding has any impact on human health. And essentially, the, the overall uh, conclusion was that if you adjust for calories, there was, yeah. there was no difference seen. And that, that includes um, for weight loss and also for blood glucose levels. So I, I think your, your point is very valid that, yes, these results are encouraging from the Dog Aging Project, but I don't think that we should be rushing ahead and recommending this to, to people and, and to patients. I'm curious to hear your I thoughts on that. Completely. Yeah, no, I agree completely. And, and again, in the the, bit, the larger review that, that we published in Science on Anti-Aging Diets, we essentially came to a similar sort of conclusion where we were looking in the mouse studies, but a lot of these dietary interventions like 
a ketogenic diet or intermittent fasting or, or time restricted feeding um, or fasting mimicking diets, you know, really trying to ask what's the evidence that they affect the biology of aging, even in mice. And the answer was once you control for caloric consumption, there's not a lot of evidence. And, and I, but I also think it's important to, to, to explicitly state that absence of evidence does not disprove the hypothesis, right? So, you know, while it may be the case in people that, you know, it's unclear whether it isocaloric intermittent fasting or isocaloric time restricted feeding has significant health benefits, the absence of data doesn't prove that it that they don't, right? So, and I think sometimes we tend to jump, we tend to jump too too quickly to either conclusion, right? Either yes, this thing is really really good for us, or no, it's not. When the reality is, we don't know, and I, and that's kind of where I fall with with a lot of these dietary interventions. I think we just don't have enough data. There are really really very few good studies in the human nutrition world in general, and particularly in the areas of of time restricted feeding, intermittent fasting. And I, and I don't mean that in, I mean, it sounds critical and it is critical. It's not necessarily the fault of the nutritionist. It's just really hard to do long-term rigorous clinical trials when you're talking about human nutrition. It's very challenging. And you know, what I was a little bit surprised by, and, and we discussed this in our review is even when you go to the mouse world where it should be easier to do these kinds of really good studies in mice, there really aren't very many that are very good where they actually carefully control for caloric intake and, and actually interpret their data, you know, in that context. And so I think it's just an area where there's a lot more that needs to be done before we can draw any strong conclusions, you know, about the beneficial or, or detrimental effects of these, these various dietary strategies that people are talking about. And before we go into that second paper in, in a lot of detail, I'm just curious what the next steps are for the dog aging project in regards to this once a day feeding. How, how do you, yeah, what, what's the plan to try and further investigate whether you're seeing a true effect here or not? Right. So I think there's a couple of things we'd like to do. One is, you know, as, um, as the study goes from being cross-sectional to longitudinal, we'll actually be able to get data on these same dogs over time. So, so, so what I mean by that is just to be clear, the data set that was in the paper that we published on uh, meal frequency was cross-sectional. We only had one time point for each dog. Those were the first surveys that the owners completed. So as time goes on every year, we'll get updates on those same dogs and we'll be able to see what do their health trajectories look like as they go through life. So I think that's going to be really interesting and, and longitudinal data for a variety of reasons is much more powerful than cross-sectional data. So that in and of itself will be interesting. Um, you know, we already alluded to some of the questions that we would like to answer. And I think we'll try to answer through follow-up surveys is, you know, what's the, uh, the, 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 um, composition of the diet. So what kind of food are these dogs eating that are fed once a day versus more than once a day? What's their obesity status? So for many of these dogs, about half of them, we actually now have electronic veterinary medical records. So we can actually look at those, those medical records and try to assess, you know, are these dogs obese? Do they have other underlying conditions? So that's stuff we can do with the data that we're already collecting. We don't at the moment have um, set plans to do a dedicated clinical trial, but I think that's something that that would be that I certainly would be interested in doing. And, and even if we don't do it in the dog aging project, I hope somebody will, you know, to really try to answer the question. If you do a double blind, it's hard, actually, it's hard to do a double blind placebo controlled trial with meal feeding frequency, but, a, but, a, you know, a, a, a controlled clinical trial um, in dogs where you actually create cohorts that are fed once a day, twice a day, three times a day, carefully controlling um, total food intake and actually ask whether or not you can see evidence for health benefits. So I think that's kind of the, you know, that's where we would all like to go to really nail down causality. Um, and, uh, and so I think at some point in the future, I think the data from this study are suggestive enough that it probably warrants that kind of a trial. And then, yeah, final question before we go into the second paper. It's around metabolic rates. So in, in mice, and I'm just speaking about a, a um, paper that I found, which suggests that the metabolic rate in mice is about 6.4 times faster compared to humans. And I'm not too sure what the conversion is for dogs, but with that difference in metabolic rate, again, how much, what, what's, the, what's the value or utility of the fasting data in dogs for, and trying to correlate that to, to human health? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And again, I think I think the answer is we really we really don't know the we don't really don't know the answer to that that question, right? And I think um, you know, again, you can look at metabolic rate. Metabolic rate is even sometimes challenging because in a lot of these studies, like caloric restriction studies in mice, you know, you'll get a very different answer if you look at the effect of these dietary interventions on metabolic rate if you, whether you normalize or not for body weight, right? Because again, many of these dietary interventions are going to change body weight. And so when you normalize metabolic rate to body weight, this is my recollection from, from talking to Rick Weindrick years ago, caloric restriction actually doesn't have much of, much of an effect, right? Because, and if anything, it makes the metabolic rate normalized to body weight go up. So I, I don't have an answer to your question, but, I, but I'm just trying to make the point that it's not even as simple as saying it's different across species. Even the way you measure metabolic rate within a species, it's not obvious what the, the right way to do that is. So, so I, I guess I prefer to look um, more at, you know, really functional outcomes, right? So, so we can guess, you know, there are people who will tell you, look, caloric restriction isn't going to, isn't going to have any great effect in people because people live a lot longer than mice or because metabolic rate is so different in people than in mice. There are people who will make statements like that. And the reality is we don't know, right? We need to, we need to do the experiments to find out. So I prefer not to try to you know, second guess the biology here and to actually just do the studies and, and try to get the answer. Right. And I think dogs, dogs are a nice place because you can actually do the studies in a time frame that that's, that's feasible. Right. So we, in principle, we could know the outcome of, uh, uh, once daily feeding clinical trial for lifespan in dogs in a few years, if it was designed appropriately. So you can actually do, I'm not saying that, that we're going to do that, but I think you, you know, the principle is you can do those kinds of studies and you can get the answer. And then you can go back and try to figure out what does it mean in terms of metabolic rate or ketone body production, right? But, but at the end of the day, what we're interested in are the functional outcomes, you know, uh, in terms of health and longevity. And that's what we should be looking at in my view. Yeah, and I, I think you've touched on how difficult it is to interpret this data, which which brings us nicely into this review paper that you've published. So walk us through what, what data you went through in this paper and yeah, what, what things you're excited about and what things less so. Sure. So I, it's interesting because, you know, when, when we first started um, thinking about this, this review paper, it was really focused on a, a pretty straightforward question, which is, you know, to what extent do these various dietary interventions that people are studying in, um, in the field of aging research actually impact the biology of aging, right? And, and so that was really the fundamental question. So um, historically, uh, caloric restriction, you know, has been sort of the gold standard for uh, an intervention that appears to slow aging, increase lifespan, and broadly improve health span in laboratory rodents and also other organisms in the laboratory. So so that I think is pretty rock solid and everybody would agree more or less with that statement. In the last couple of decades, there have been a variety of alternative dietary strategies that people have begun studying in the field, like ketogenic diet, intermittent fasting, fasting mimicking diets, protein restriction, amino acid restriction, branch chain amino acid restriction, right? So the list has gotten, you know, not long, but there's probably seven or eight of these different sort of nutritional strategies that, that people are studying. And they often get talked about as if they're the same as caloric restriction in terms of their benefits, right? That that's the perception, at least, I think, if you read some of the review articles that are usually written by the people who are studying these things and have a vested interest in making the case that these things actually affect aging. So, so we kind of set out to, and, and, and I had noticed, you know, over the last few years that these diets have permeated the sort of uh, mainstream consciousness, sometimes because of reported effects on aging, sometimes for other reasons. But there, there are a lot of people now who have heard about and even started practicing intermittent fasting, fasting mimicking diets, ketogenic diet, um, sometimes protein restriction, right? So, so I think it was, it was the observation that a lot of people are starting to do this. And at least my perception was that it wasn't clear how much these diets were impacting the biology of aging that led me to, to, to kind of propose the idea that, that we might want to do a, do a critical review, you know, around this area. Um, and, and so that's really what led us to, to tackle this. Um, and so we jumped in and, you know, we started from the perspective of let's just take a look at the data in mice and, and rats, but most of it's in mice and not worry so much about the human data for now. 
And, you know, the first thing that became apparent to me was this, this issue that we've already touched on, which is that very rarely do people actually control for caloric intake, right? So in many of the studies, particularly uh, around intermittent fasting, fasting mimicking diet, things like that, when you actually look at the data, the mice are fed anywhere from 20 to 30% less than the control mice, which is really caloric restriction. So, so as soon as you fail to control for caloric intake, it becomes really hard to know, is, are any benefits that are observed a consequence of that specific dietary intervention or a consequence of caloric restriction? And so that I think was one of the first take home messages is, you know, to some extent, you, you kind of have to throw your hands up and say, we don't know because nobody actually did the experiment carefully, um, which is unfortunate, but it's a reality of most of the literature in this area that most of these dietary interventions in mice where people report, report large effects on health and lifespan, the mice are also calorically restricted, which really in my view limits the interpretation as to whether it's caloric restriction that caused those benefits or the, the dietary interventions themselves. And there's a lot to unpack within that statement. And that's a generalization, but that was one of the first thing con conclusions that I came to when, when we started really diving into the data. With all of this data that that's quite difficult to interpret, one paper that I particularly want to get your opinion on is the 2014 paper published in Cell Metabolism, where they gave, I think it was 16 different cohorts um, of diet, yeah. if you like, um, and it seemed that diets that were low in protein and high in carbohydrate were re resulted in, in the greatest lifespan extension. So I'm, I'm curious here what, what you think about that paper. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think it's, I think it's a really interesting, interesting strategy to try to approach this question. So this is around the idea of nutritional geometry, which is, you know, you can create a whole series of, you know, what should be in principle, isocaloric diets of different macronutrient composition and look at, you know, a variety of health outcomes, in, including lifespan. I think that approach is a really, a really smart, uh, conceptual approach. It's difficult in practice to do, I, I don't want to say, well, I think they did it well. I think, I think it's difficult to do in a way that isn't, that is going to be completely satisfying to everybody and answer all the questions. And so, you know, honestly, I would say if you really want somebody to do a deep dive on that, you should number one, talk to the people who did it. And number two, talk to John Speakman, because I think they're, they're really the ones who can, who can, can give you the, the nuts and bolts of, of that study. Um, there were a couple of things that I noticed that, 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 you know, make me wonder whether the, uh, the interpretation of that study is going to be broadly applicable outside of, you know, that specific mouse strain and that specific dietary composition. So I'll first tell you the interpretation. The interpretation was that if you look across the landscape of macronutrient ratios, in general, diets that are lower in protein tend to be associated with better health outcomes and longer lifespan in mice. That's sort of the take-home message that, that that group made in that paper and in their subsequent reports. Um, and I think if you only look at their data, that's a reasonable interpretation. There are a couple of things that are a little bit concerning about that study. One is, you know, we've already talked about in the particular mouse strain that they used, um, which is C57 black sex, um, we know that caloric restriction works really well, right? Um, uh, and yet in that study, the, the, the lower caloric content um, was not associated with longer lifespan. So that's one thing that just you just have to kind of take a step back and say, okay, this isn't what we would expect. Doesn't mean it's wrong. It's not what we would expect. Um, uh, so that's one thing to, to think about. Um, the, the thing that caught my attention, and we noticed this in our in we noted this in the paper though, was if you actually so if you look on average across the whole landscape, yes, lower protein is associated with better health outcomes and longer lifespan. If you just rank order the individual diets and you look at the effect on lifespan, the diet that gave the longest lifespan had a very high protein content actually, which is exactly the opposite of the overall message that they want you to believe. And that was completely ignored. So that to me immediately, you know, <laughs> raises some, some red flags in my mind. It's like, I, I know what you want me to believe, but when I actually look at the data, <laughs> the, the, the example that gives you the biggest effect on lifespan, the direction you want it to go is exactly the opposite of what you're trying to tell me. And anytime I find something like that, I start to feel like somebody's trying to sell me something and it might not actually be true. So I'm not, again, I'm not saying that they, I'm not saying they were wrong. I'm not even saying they didn't, they did anything wrong, but I have a hard time reconciling that one fact 
that the diet that gave the longest lifespan, the best health outcomes was very high in protein. And yet you're trying to tell me that a low protein diet is universally good. That clearly is not true, right? That clearly is not true. And I think what it reflects again is that we just don't have a great understanding of all the different interactions that come into play here. And, um, and the relationship of macronutrients, you know, is going to be important, but, but, but also important is, you know, a, a lot of other stuff that we can't even capture in a mouse study, right? So trying to extract, so my real concern is more around trying to extrapolate from those mouse studies to humans than it is, you know, trying to understand the mechanisms at play in mice. That's, and, and if I had to make one sort of take home message um, from our review, uh, aside from the importance of controlling for caloric intake, it's that my view right now is that given the state of research, um, these diets and trying to extrapolate that to have an impact on human health is probably not a great idea. What I think these dietary interventions are good for is understanding the mechanisms at play in laboratory animals, right? Because then once we know the mechanisms, we can actually start to ask, number one, are the same mechanisms at play for human aging? And number two, maybe there are better ways to tweak those mechanisms than diets. And I think, you know, this is another big picture concept that most people don't get. Diets are really, really dirty drugs. And what I mean by that is, you know, you take a drug like rapamycin, we know the specific biochemical target. It's a very specific drug, doesn't have much in the way of off-target effects. And you compare that to something like caloric restriction or a ketogenic diet, which is hitting tens of thousands of proteins in the cell, right? These are, these are about the dirtiest drugs you could ever imagine. And so trying to think that a diet is going to give you a very specific outcome, you know, when it's that dirty and not have any side effects, I, th I think it's just wishful thinking. And, but most people don't think about diets that way because we're trained to think about a drug, you know, in one way, and we're trained to think about lifestyle interventions in a different way. And I actually think there's some value in, in not trying to think about them differently, trying to think about them the same way. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get into sort of mTOR and rapamycin uh, soon. And yeah. in terms of, you know, whether that's actually what we're targeting here with, with diet, but I do just want to drill down a bit more about the protein um, aspect of these diets. So we, we've talked a bit about the, the mice data um, with protein intake. What about the human data? Yeah. So again, you know, anytime we, we jump into the human realm, we just have to admit that it's going to be messy. Right. So, so I don't think there's, I don't think there is um, anything that I feel like rock solid, take it to the bank about when it comes to protein composition and, and diet. So a couple of things to say in general about protein restriction. So there's actually, let's take a step back. You can look at sort of um, protein content in diet and, and, and try to do epidemiological comparisons to ask, you know, if we just look at protein content in diet, can we draw any big picture conclusions about health in people, right? Um, and so I would say there, my, my view of the data is that it's probably the case in people eating a Western diet, I think that's important to appreciate, that when people are younger, a low protein diet is associated with lower all cause mortality and a variety of um, disease risk factors. So, you know, again, very simplistic, but I think the data, you know, you can, you can make an argument that in young people eating a Western diet, if you eat a lower protein Western diet, that's probably better for health outcomes and your risk of dying. When people hit the age of about 65, there seems to be a pattern that it flips and actually above the age of about 65, having a higher protein composition in your diet is associated with better health outcomes and reduced mortality. And that isn't completely understood. I think, you know, one simple idea would be, we know that muscle loss is a real problem in older people and maintaining lean mass is a real problem. And so, you know, maybe as we get older, our body's ability to utilize the dietary protein to maintain muscle mass declines. And so you have to bump it up a little bit. That's totally a speculation, but it kind of makes sense with, with, with what we think, what we know about declines in lean mass as, as people get older. So that's, that's kind of the take home message, right? Is below 65, if you're eating a typical Western diet, low protein is probably a little bit better above 65 low protein is probably a little bit worse, but I keep saying, if you're eating a typical Western diet, because I think that's really important. I think we don't have much data, if any, on the relationship between 
protein composition in the diet and people who maybe aren't eating a typical Western diet. And, you know, <laughs> for better or worse, most of the people who are worried about protein composition in their diet are the same people who are probably not eating a typical Western diet, right? And so those are the people who, if anyone are gonna, are gonna start trying to change their dietary patterns based on you know mouse studies or human epidemiological data. And it's my intuition that those same relationships probably don't apply if you're normal weight, you know, eating a relatively healthy diet, and we can try to dive into what that even means. What do we mean by a healthy diet? Um, but I think you just have to accept that these, these epidemiological studies are done on the general population. And the general population, you know, is going to be different than a lot of people's individual situation. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that about the, the difference between a so-called healthy person and someone who's not. So, you know, in patients that I see in the clinic who are overweight and want to lose yeah, and, and want to lose some of that weight, generally I try and encourage them to start gently increasing their protein intake because um, yeah. that, that seems to satisfy them a bit more in, in terms of their hunger um, and, and right. uh, along with other strategies as well, seems to slowly get their weight down. Um, so I, I agree with you that, you know, we, we it's very tricky um, and <laughs> we probably shouldn't be doing it in terms of extrapolating data from one group to another. Um, so we, we've talked a bit about protein. I want to talk, I want to ask your opinion about fat content now um, and, and particularly leaning into the ketogenic diet. So I'll leave that with you. What, what, what did you find? Um, well, so I think uh, for ketogenic diet in, in particular, again, um, in mice, one thing so, so I'll tell you the data for the, the, there's, there's really two ketogenic diet studies in mice that are, you know, really looking at, at aging and lifespan. And, um, one thing to appreciate about a ketogenic diet in mice is you have to go much lower in carbohydrates than you do in people. Right. So, so in mice, in order to really get a uh, significant ketogenesis, you got to go, go down to about 1% carbohydrates in the diet. So these are very, very low carbohydrate diets. Um, and in both studies, they found some evidence, they found pretty, what I think is pretty good evidence for improved metabolic health during aging. So better insulin sensitivity, uh, <clears throat> glucose response profiles, um, and some evidence for other, other age related health span metrics, the effects on lifespan, um, were inconsistent and relatively small. And so what I mean by that is there were in both studies, they tried a continuous ketogenic diet in one study that extended lifespan in the other study, it didn't in the study where the continuous ketogenic diet did not extend lifespan. They also tried a cyclic ketogenic diet where they saw a small increase in lifespan. But in both cases, even when lifespan was extended, it was on the order of, you know, maybe 10%. Okay. And so just to give people a, a, a flavor for what that what that means, right? So caloric restriction in mice, the biggest effect that I know of that's ever been reported is about a 60% increase in average lifespan. At about 30% caloric restriction, you get about a 30% increase in average lifespan. So these effects from ketogenic diet are much, much smaller than the effects that previously have been shown um, with true caloric restriction. So I think it's just useful to appreciate that, you know, while there might be something there, it's, it's relatively small in impact, um, in mice, at least compared to true caloric restriction. So, so that's the data in mice. And there's not a lot beyond that. So there are lots of people now studying, you know, can you get similar or maybe even better benefits by supplementing with ketone esters? The idea being there is that maybe these ketone bodies themselves are driving some of the benefits of the ketogenic diet. Nothing has really been published in my view that's super convincing in that area yet. Um, uh, and then, you know, the question of uh, how much of this might be related to the amount of fat in the diet or the amount of metabolism that is, that is um, fat metabolism. Again, really open question in the mouse studies. I don't know of anything that, that, um, that strongly would argue one, one way or the other. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's early days still, and we really don't have a lot of answers. Now, what does that mean for, for people? And again, you know, I'm not a nutritionist, so anything I say should, should probably be taken with a grain of salt. This is sort of my opinion, um, which is subject to change as I learn more, like everybody should be. Um, but my sort of feeling is that, that again, we really don't know, and it's probably going to be very individual, right? And this is another point that we tried to make in the, in the review article is that even in mice, the impact of these 
diets on health outcomes and longevity is very dependent on genetic background. And I think the same thing's probably going to be true in people. So, you know, the, the best answer is there is no one size fits all answer, right? And so a, a ketogenic diet or a high fat diet, low carb diet might be really good for me. It might be really bad for you. And we're just now starting to, to even figure out how to look at that. So, so I don't think there's a single answer, but if I had to make a generalization, I am of the opinion that for most people, fat is not the problem. Simple carbohydrates are the problem for most people. That's my personal opinion. And obviously that's again, a generalization. And it's probably the combination of simple carbohydrates and fat that's really the problem. But I think in general, for most people, if you can, if you can take care of the simple carbohydrates in your diet, more or less the rest will take care of itself. And again, that's a major generalization and sure, you should try to eat healthy foods and all the rest. But I think if you had to start one place, again, for most people, it's not gonna be true for everyone. That's sort of my intuition um, for the best strategy. Yeah, I'd agree with that. That's one of the first things that I try and encourage my patients at the clinic to do is if you can control one thing, it is the yeah. simple carbohydrates, the, the sugars in the diet. But that leads me on to um, my question with the ketogenic diet studies in mice. I had a, when I went through it, I had a problem with the control diet because when I was having a look at the control diet, it seemed to be quite high in sugar. And so I was wondering, you know, are you seeing these lifespan differences because the control diet is just high in sugar, whereas the ketogenic diet isn't. It could, that could be part of it. Although, you know, I, I don't remember the specific diet that they used in those studies, but as a generalization, um, most mouse diets are pretty high in carbohydrates, but that's a lot of fiber. When you actually dig into what the carbohydrates are, those are generally, you know, what we would consider relatively healthy carbs um, and low glycemic index carbs. So I don't know the answer to your question, but but it is definitely the case that, that most of the mouse chows they're not high in, in simple sugars, unless you are specifically trying to test the effect of a, of a Western diet in mice. And then people will add in, you know, simple sugars and fat, usually in combination to, to, to cause obesity. So I, if I had to guess, I would guess that's probably not a major concern in those studies, but I'd also have to go back and look specifically at the diets that they used. And, and before we, we go into carbohydrates in detail, I just want to finish up with fats. So th there's a big debate, if you like, what, depending yeah. on who you talk with, about <laughs> saturated versus unsaturated fats. So I've got, I've got my views, but I'm, I'm curious to hear what, what your, what your views are. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to pass on that one. Cause okay. I feel like that's outside my area of expertise. And, okay. you know, there are a lot of scientists who like to have very strong opinions on things they know nothing about. I, I try not to do that. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'd like to hear your opinion though, because I'm trying to educate myself a bit on this topic. And again, my, I guess my gut feeling is it's going to be complicated and it's probably going to depend on, you know, context is going to be very important for the, the relative, um, uh, consequences of these different types of fats that, that are present in the diet. Yeah. Essentially my opinion is that, and, and this kind of follows what the American Heart Foundation or, or association um, suggests is that if, if you had to pick one, I'd probably go with the unsaturated fat. Um, but, but overall it's the general picture of your diet. You know, if, if your diet's filled with, you know, lots of, lots of cream and, um, and sort of animal fats and in that regard, that's probably less that that's probably less good for you compared to things like olive oil. Um, if, if you had to pick one. So, yeah. but if, if a patient was sitting in front of me asking, you know, what is a healthy diet? I'd just be suggesting to them overall whole foods, lots of fiber, low sugar. Um, and sorry, it's essentially, I, I don't think that we know all of the answers with saturated versus unsaturated. And I don't think that people focusing on that is really where the money is for their diet. I think it's more yeah. the, as you've suggested that the sugar intake um, and also fiber intake. Yeah. And that's, that's really interesting to hear you say that because I think, you know, in a general sense, oftentimes we tend to get over hyper-focused on the details, right? When there are just a few big picture things that you should probably do first. Yeah. And I think that that may be an example where, you know, the data that's available, again, it's going to depend on the population where those studies were done, right? Um, but that may not be the most important thing to focus on, at least at first. So that's kind of like advanced topics. Yeah. Let's deal with the basics first, and then we can get to the advanced topics. Yeah. So let's move into carbohydrates. So, so I, I think, 
most people would agree that simple carbohydrates aren't great for the body. What about so-called complex or, you know, low glycemic index carbohydrates? So again, I, I mean, this is not my area of expertise. So this is, a, this is, you know, my I- intuition based on, <clears throat> you know, what I, what I have studied, which is the biology of aging. So again, the one thing that's important to appreciate, and I've alluded to this a couple of times is that, you know, what might be true for health outcomes in the general population today may or may not have anything to do with the biology of aging, right? So the studies in mice where we're looking at, you know, lifespan and health span, um, those studies are specifically focused on the biology of aging. The fact is that the average person in the United States, right, is at least overweight, if not obese, probably not exercising much. And so there are probably some dietary strategies that can be taken in that population that will improve health outcomes that have nothing to do with the biology of aging, right? And so I think that's just something something to appreciate. Um, and, and our review was mostly focused on the role in aging. So if you're talking about the general population, you know, I, again, I think big picture, right? Substituting the, the simple sugars with complex carbohydrates is gonna be a good thing for most people who are eating an unhealthy diet and overweight or obese. Um, the advanced topic question would then be, you know, if you can get to a healthy weight and maintain it, can you tweak things a little bit more to, to, to give yourself an even better chance of living a long, healthy life by modifying your diet on top of that? And, and I think the answer when it comes to simple carbs versus, you know, uh, uh, substituting those with protein or fat in maybe a more ketogenic state, I think we just don't know the answer. I, I, and honestly, again, I think it's going to, it's going to come down to the individual person, but you know, in my view, even maintaining a healthy weight, the biggest challenge, and I, I'm guessing you would agree with this is compliance, right? You can tell people what to do, actually getting them to do it and then being able to stick to it is the hard part. And so my view is we shouldn't try to find a one size fits all solution, right? What works for you might not work for me. And so I think there we should just focus on general principles, right? Um, uh, and try to figure out what's going to work for each individual to get them down to a healthy weight before we dive into, you know, what might affect their biology of aging and slow the aging process. Yeah, I so I'm sorry, agree. I kind of dodged the question, but I but I also think it's important to you know to make that point, right? No, I completely agree that we need to find diets that, that work for that individual person, and that's one of the things that the nutritionists. Um, at least the lectures that I go to, they really emphasize that, that it's very difficult to get people to stick to a radically different diet compared to what they are on already. And what seems to work, and it's a slow process, is if you make these small incremental changes yeah. over a longer period of time, changes that they can actually stick to for the rest of their lives. Um, otherwise, you know, you just go through the classic yo-yo diet. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's amazing how much of this is habit, right? And And if you can get into replacing bad habits with good habits, you know, that can be maintained over the long term. And on, on that point about how, how difficult it is to lose weight, one of the things that excites me is, and, and this kind of comes into the, the drugs versus or, or and diet, um, yeah. is GLP-1 receptor agonists. So, so this is a, a medication used for diabetes, and I've been prescribing it quite a lot to my patients now that it's available in New Zealand. But we seem to be getting fantastic weight loss benefits with it. Um, so I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, I, I kind of want to segue now into using drugs, which historically we've been thinking, you know, big pharma, bad diet, good. And I'm, I'm quite curious to hear your thoughts around that. Sorry. What, so what's the what's the specific question? So I, I, I want I want to know w- uh, what the utility of using medications um, versus using a diet and, and the overall right. effect that, that we can see. Sure. So again, I think it, you know, I think again, it's useful to, to draw the dividing line between um, medications that might help people get down to a healthy weight and medications that might actually target the biology of aging. And, and there's going to be an intersection there, right? I think there are going to be some things that do both, but I think that the, 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 the way you think about those medications is different and the data that you want to see to really convince you that they're working is going to be different. Um, so again, my expertise is in the biology of aging. And this gets back to this, this point that I made earlier, which is that I think a lot of these dietary interventions 
that people are studying in mice are really, really great tools for understanding that biology and for figuring out the mechanisms that connect, say, caloric restriction to slower aging, increased lifespan, improved health span. Because once you, once you have a feel for what the genes and the proteins are that are mediating those effects, then you can actually go look for drugs that target those proteins and ask, can those drugs recapitulate the benefits of something like caloric restriction, but without actually practicing caloric restriction, right? And I think that's that's where, I mean, the fee, that, that's, no, that's nothing new in the field. People have been trying to find, you know, what we call caloric restriction mimetics for 25 years. Um, what's exciting is I think that, that we actually have at least one that works really well and a few others where there's, you know, at least some evidence that you can get health benefits from, from treating mice. And we're starting to learn about this in people with these drugs that are associated with caloric restriction. And so, so in that context, I think, um, you know, we talked about this in the paper, you can point to a network, a nutrient response network that is highly evolutionarily conserved, that seems to underlie at least many of the benefits associated with caloric restriction. And we know about many of the players in this network, and we know about some drugs that target this network. And so now, you know, there's a lot of interest in um, asking whether or not those same drugs can have beneficial health effects in, in people. And the ones I think that we talked about a bit in the review, rapamycin, of course, we can talk more about rapamycin, metformin, which, which is of course an, an anti-diabetes drug, um, mechanism of action, not completely known, but it clearly tweaks this network in interesting ways. Um, people are excited about NAD precursors, um, you know, some of these uh, drugs like uh, acarbose, which affect uh, uptake of um, sugar from the gut um, or an affecting carbohydrate metabolism. So there are a handful now, five or six different drugs that people are studying that have been shown to have effects sometimes not repro reproducible effects, but have been shown to have effects on lifespan in mice and health span in mice. And so it's an interesting question whether or not those same drugs will have beneficial effects on healthy aging in, in people, which of course is a much more challenging question to answer. Um, but again, I think, you know, we want to be a little bit careful because let's just take uh, rapamycin, for example. We know in a mouse, you can treat the mouse with rapamycin, it'll extend lifespan, 10 to 30% broadly delay or reverse functional declines of aging, you know, that might work really well in a healthy weight person. I'm not suggesting that people go out and start taking rapamycin necessarily, but it might work really well in a healthy weight person. It might be completely different physiology in, in an obese person, right? And so again, you know, most of these studies of aging in mice are in a context that we would consider relatively healthy in a person. And that may not apply to much of the general population. So I think that's just something we have to appreciate before we start trying to make recommendations um, to the general public. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one of the things that, because I, I do want to dive into mTOR and rapamycin a bit more, because one of the headings that, that I found quite interesting in that paper is mTOR inhibition, a common mechanism for anti-aging diet. So it, it, yeah, curious to hear your thoughts. Is with the diet changes that, that we're trying to make with caloric restriction or, you know, low protein diets, is it mTOR that that's the primary reason for, for why we're seeing potential impacts? Yeah. So it's a good question. And again, I think we have to be honest. We don't completely know the answer to that question. So what I would say is it's almost certain that inhibition of mTOR plays a role in the health benefits of these dietary interventions. It's almost certain it's not the only thing that is playing a role in these health benefits from dietary interventions. So, you know, people, it's funny because there are people in the field who will, you know, get into great debates about whether caloric restriction and rapamycin are acting through the same mechanism, the same pathway, right? And so they try to do these, you know, not very well thought out experiments where you combine caloric restriction with rapamycin and ask what happens. And, you know, first of all, I think those are real, those sort of I would call those, you know, pharmacogenetic epi epistasis experiments are really hard to interpret. Um, but secondly, it's not necessary. Look, it's very simple. mTOR inhibition and caloric restriction are overlapping but distinct interventions. It is clear that caloric restriction inhibits mTOR, cyclically probably, but it inhibits mTOR. It is clear that rapamycin inhibits mTOR. 
it is clear that they both induce common downstream effects like inducing autophagy and reducing inflammation. And it's pretty clear that those common downstream effects are accounting for many of the health benefits we see from those interventions. So while I can't prove that, that part of the mechanism of caloric restriction is through inhibition of mTOR, it almost certainly is. And, and you know, if you wanna argue the opposite, you're welcome to do that. But, but to me, there's really no good rationale for arguing that. So, so I, think, I think, yes, we can make a case that all of these dietary interventions impact mTOR signaling similarly to rapamycin to some extent. And it is the simplest explanation, at least, that they share a common downstream mechanism. But I certainly would not argue that, that everything that we see associated with caloric restriction is due to inhibition of mTOR. Um, and just like I wouldn't argue that a ketogenic diet is equivalent to caloric restriction, right? These things are overlapping. They have, there is some common similarities there, but, but they're also different, right? And I already talked about how caloric restriction is an extremely dirty drug, right? Inhibition of mTOR by rapamycin in a non-caloric restricted state in some ways is very specific. You're doing a very specific thing. Inhibition of mTOR from caloric restriction is going to be very different because the entire physiology of the animal is different because it's calorically restricted, right? So it's not surprising that, that if you look at gene expression profiles or metabolomics or any other sort of high dimensional uh, type of data that you want to look at, that, that they aren't, that, that rapamycin in a fed animal is going to look different than caloric restriction. So that was sort of a long diatribe on this point, but it's a little bit frustrating that, you know, some of my colleagues don't think about this in a, in a little bit more sophisticated way. Um, uh, I think it's clear that these things are overlapping, but I certainly would never argue that mTOR is the only thing that is underlying the effects of these diets. One of the things that you touched on was if you switch mTOR off, you, you activate autophagy, um, which I've talked about a, a bit on this channel. And for, for me personally, I use prolonged fasting to try and switch mTOR off to, to activate autophagy. But I know that the evidence is, in, in humans at least, it is quite weak around that. But I'm, I'm curious to hear what, what your thoughts are about using prolonged fasting, so, so more than a couple of days of fasting, to try and switch yeah. mTOR off. What, what's your opinion about that? So I, I think you're right. I think, first of all, it's hard it's hard to know um, to what extent, there's two things to say. One is it's hard to know to what extent fasting is really uh, inhibiting mTOR and inducing autophagy in part because we don't have great tools for measuring that um, that don't envir involve sacrificing the animal or the person, which we don't want to sacrifice anybody. Um, and, and because it's going to be tissue specific, right? So we know this even from mice that the, if you look at mTOR signaling biochemically following a, a fast of a fixed period of time, if you look in different tissues, the extent to which mTOR is inhibited is different in different tissues. So that's one thing that's important to, to appreciate. And then when it comes to autophagy, there are really no great ways to measure autophagy in vivo in a living animal or a living person. So it's more a matter of, I think, not having really good tools to allow us to assess, you know, to what extent does fasting induce autophagy and inhibit mTOR in different tissues. I think from, you know, if you want to take the 10,000 foot view, it is absolutely the case that a prolonged fast on average is going to inhibit mTOR probably in most tissues, if not all. Um, and it will induce autophagy to some extent over sort of the fully fed state, right? So I think that there, there's no reason to think that's not the case. And that's what the biology, at least as we understand it now, would strongly suggest. So I think that's probably correct. Um, the thing to appreciate, appreciate about autophagy though, is that it's not something that you wanna have on all the time, right? So autophagy you know, involves taking macromolecules, sometimes whole organelles, sending them to the lysosome to be degraded. You don't wanna constantly be chewing up your cells. You also have to build at some point. And so, you know, that's why I think it's a little bit unclear whether really prolonged fasting, you know, at, at what point does it stop being beneficial and start becoming detrimental? Um, and again, we just don't, don't really have a great answer to that. And I think that's a really important point that you need periods of time where you're building, but also periods of time where you're recycling. Um, right. And yeah, and, and that's, you know, 
when it comes to rapamycin in humans, at least for the trial design that, that I've come up with, um, intermittent rapamycin seems to be the way to go. Um, right. So, yeah, um, in, in terms of, and if you're not comfortable answering this, it's absolutely fine, but what, how often do you take, because I know you take rapamycin, how often do you take it and at what yeah. dose? Yeah. So, so I'll say, first of all, this is all self-experimentation, yeah. right? So there is no right answer to this question when you ask people, right? It's kind of like, you know, um, we're all trying different things. So I would say, uh, first of all, it's worth, it's worth stating what has typically been done in the clinical world with rapamycin almost exclusively that's been in organ transplant patients, um, taking daily rapamycin, you know, a few MIGs typically of rapamycin every day, in combination with strong immunosuppressants, right? So that's the context for most of the data we have on uh, immune function and other side effects associated with rapamycin. What has emerged in the, um, I don't know what the right word is, the, the, the biohacker community, maybe, I never really considered myself a biohacker, but, um, but you know, the people who are self-experimenting with different interventions, including rapamycin, what has sort of emerged in that community of, you know, otherwise normal health status individuals is this idea of once weekly dosing. Um, and some people are now trying once every two weeks. Again, it's all guesswork, but that sort of once weekly dosing paradigm, um, uh, has some support in the clinical literature from a couple of clinical trials where uh, a derivative of rapamycin was being used to study uh, rejuvenation of immune function in elderly people. And it was observed that in terms of efficacy, once weekly dosing looked a little bit better than daily dosing. And in terms of side effects, once weekly dosing looked a little bit better than daily dosing. So that, that combined with this idea that we were just talking about, that you want this sort of cyclic inhibition of mTOR, activation of autophagy, followed by a, a, a restoration of, of growth, um, has, has led to most people sort of settling on once weekly dosing, you know, somewhere in the four to eight or 10 mig range, right? And again, it's all guesswork. Very few people are actually measuring blood levels of rapamycin. We've already talked about how there aren't great ways to measure autophagy in vivo. Um, so it's, it's often, you know, how does it make me feel when I do this? Right. And if I feel good, then I'll stick with it. And if I don't feel good, then maybe I'll change the dose or I'll stop taking it. So that's, and unfortunately, that's kind of where we're at right now. We need clinical trials like the one that you're, you're proposing, like some others that, that other people are proposing to actually start to figure out, you know, what is optimal dosing? What do the side effects look like? What are the evidence for efficacy? Okay. So that was my prelude to what do I do? And I've tried a couple of different things. It's always been once weekly dosing, um, between six and 10 MIGs a week, usually for a period of about eight to 10 weeks. So not only cycling once a week, but cycling when I do it. And, you know, I, I I've talked about this a couple of times. I, I can't recall if on the first time I came on your podcast, I told the story, but you know, part of what makes me a believer is that, that, um, this sort of cyclic once weekly dosing completely cured, uh, adhesive capsulitis or, or what people call frozen shoulder in my right shoulder. So it worked for me for that. I don't know if it's going to work for anything else for aging, but it absolutely had a, a profound impact on my quality of life by fixing that problem, which was a real problem for me. Um, and so because that worked for me, I feel pretty comfortable sticking with that sort of a protocol. And I've never experienced any side effects that I can attribute to the, to the, the rapamycin. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. I wasn't sure if we were allowed to be yeah, privy to, it's okay to, to talk about it. To... Yeah. I, I don't, again, you know, I think 10 years ago, I might've been a little bit hesitant to talk about it, but I think they're, they're, I'm not recommending that anybody do this, but I also think if we don't tell our own stories, you know, the information is never going to get out there. And I'm trying to work on ways to capture some of these case reports. Cause I think there are a lot of interesting stories out there about people who have been taking rapamycin, some of whom have had, you know, pretty, uh, profound experiences. And so I think getting that information out there is useful, but of course we always have to say, you know, we don't know in, in any individual what the outcomes are going to be. We really don't know yet what the, the risk profile looks like. Um, and so we just have to be honest that, that this is a work in progress. And while we're talking about sort of drugs and, and medications that may impact um, the aging process, I'm curious to hear your opinion about SGLT2 inhibitors. 
So in the intervention testing program, they seem to have an, an improved lifespan. And right. in diabetic patients, and this is a medication that I'm prescribing to a lot of my diabetic patients, we seem to be getting quite good results. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts about SGLT2 inhibitors. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's, I think that's one of the more exciting sort of emerging interventions uh, in the field right now because of exactly what you just said, right? Effective in diabetic patients seem to increase lifespan in mice from the interventions testing program. Um, the effects aren't as big as rapamycin. So I think, you know, at least not in both sexes. So, but, but I think we should also say there hasn't been as much attempt to optimize dose yet with those drugs in mice. So we don't know yet um, whether they are going to be as good or better than rapamycin in terms of magnitude of effect in mice. So I think there is, I, I would say it's very early days with those drugs in mice, very promising, but, but now is when we really need to start to do, you know, the, the detailed studies to look at different doses. Importantly, I think really importantly, different timings of when you start the treatment. So, you know, one of the things about rapamycin that makes it to my mind, particularly interesting from a translational perspective is not only can you start the treatment in mice late in life, you can actually do transient treatments started late in life and still get pretty big benefits. So we need to find out whether or not that's also the case um, with these other drugs. And, And that'll just take time, right? Unfortunately, you know, mouse lifespan experiments are not fast experiments, it's gotten better because, because now you can actually purchase old mice directly from, from commercial suppliers. You don't have to age them from, you know, day one in your own lab, but it still takes a while. It's really, even when you purchase the old mice, you know, it's really pretty much a year long experiment to figure out what the impact of your intervention is going to be. So I think we'll know a lot more in a few years, um, uh, about, about these drugs and other interventions that are that are being tested in the intervention testing program. So, you know, they have a pipeline of, of things where they start five or six different interventions every year. So every year we're sort of getting a new set and sometimes it's disappointing. Nothing really has a big effect. Sometimes two or three things will have an effect. So I think that, um, you know, that's one of the exciting things about the field right now is we've got really interesting candidates to be looking at in humans right now, but we're gonna continue to, to get additional candidates, hopefully some of them will actually work better than rapamycin. I know I sound like a broken record, but I always come back to this. People get all excited about the newest shiny object. And I'm just like, show me one thing that works better than rapamycin and I'll jump on board. But, um, but so far we haven't seen that. So, so maybe at some point we'll get there. Sorry, again, I didn't really dive into the, the, the details of these particular molecules, but I think, you know, I think the take home message is um, we need more work in the mice to really tease out how effective they're going to be. It looks pretty promising right now, I would say. And it's encouraging, you know, that these things are used in people. We already know they have clinical benefit in a specific patient population. Um, so so that, that obviously makes it easier to envision, you know, translation outside of that patient population for potential health benefits, more broadly speaking. And one final molecule that, that I want to ask your opinion about, the intervention testing program hasn't got around to this one yet, but it's alpha-ketoglutarate, which yeah. is generating quite, quite a lot of hype. Um, and particularly on the basis of a 2020 paper that came out, sh- which suggested a lifespan extension with alpha-ketoglutarate. Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, because in, in my view, we don't really have much of, if any, human data um, to, to really make a, a conclusion. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so let me see, there's a few things I could say one, not as good as rapamycin. I'm just going to keep saying that till somebody shows me something that's better than rapamycin. Um, but I think that the data on alpha ketoglutarate is, is, is again, it's, it's, it's compelling, but early, right? So you alluded to the, the, the paper from, uh, Brian Kennedy and Gordon Lithgow, where they showed that, um, alpha ketoglutarate supplementation, uh, increased lifespan in nematode worms and C. elegans. And then when supplemented late in life had a pretty small effect on lifespan in mice, but seemed to uh, reduce frailty and improve some measures of health in mice. And that looked, that data looked pretty good. Um, and so now the question is, right, what, what will the impact be in, in humans? Um, there was a paper that just, just came out in aging. It's, it's not a It's not a particularly satisfying paper because there wasn't placebo controlled, but they did do a small study where they 
showed in people taking an alpha ketoglutarate supplement that there was a something like a seven or eight year reversal in the epigenetic clock, the aging epigenetic clock in those people. So first of all, um, I'm not a huge believer in the epigenetic clocks. I'm, I'm probably among the most skeptical in the aging field right now, but it, it is consistent with the idea that alpha ketoglutarate in humans, you know, is probably having an impact on, on something related to the biology of aging. So that's, that's nice. That, that, that's encouraging. We'll wait for the placebo controlled trial to, to actually show, you know, that that effect was different from placebo. And one thing I should say is placebo effect is real, right? And I think what we'll see in some of these placebo controlled trials is that you'll see a change in the epigenetic clock in the placebo group. Again, whether that tells us that it's the placebo effect or the epigenetic clocks aren't telling us what we think they're telling us, I think you're going to see that. So we'll have to wait and see with alpha ketoglutarate. Um, the one thing I'll say about alpha ketoglutarate is it's it's almost certainly safe, right? So I think we know a, enough about alpha ketoglutarate supplementation that it's very unlikely that 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 alpha ketoglutarate supplementation is going to cause significant adverse events in people, and that's that's important. Um, and the biology, you know. The biology does make sense, right? It, 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 given where alpha ketoglutarate sits in the TCA cycle and how it ties into amino acid biosynthesis, um, you know, it's plausible that you could be tweaking this, this same network that I alluded to before that includes mTOR and, and AMP kinase um, in ways that are consistent with uh, improved health outcomes during aging. So. So I would say I'm, you know, cautiously optimistic about alpha ketoglutarate, but also I would say, you know, based on the mouse data so far, um, I don't think it's going to have big effects. So I don't think it's going to be, you know, something that, that really moves the needle a lot when it comes to health outcomes in people. But I, I certainly will change my mind if somebody, you know, two years from now publishes a paper that shows big effects on lifespan or health span bigger than what was in that paper in mice, or even better, you know, double blind placebo controlled clinical trial data from people. Yeah, thanks for that insight. Um, I know we're starting to run out of time. So is there anything that you'd like to, to leave my viewers in any, any sort of final thoughts or, or concluding remarks? Sure. I think the, the one thing we haven't talked about, which we did cover in that um, the review paper on the anti-aging diets is, you know, the importance of genetic background in, even in the mouse studies, in the way that individuals respond to these diets. And this has really only been looked at carefully in true caloric restriction. Um, but, you know, it sort of gets presented both in the scientific literature and to the general public, you know, that these, these diets are universally good, right? Um, they're universally healthy. If you just look at caloric restriction in mice, that's not the case. When people have looked across, you know, many, many different genetic backgrounds, somewhere between 20 and 30% of the individual genetic backgrounds have their lifespan shortened by caloric restriction. So on average, yes, lifespan is extended. But if you happen to be one of those unlucky genetic backgrounds, it's not a great thing for you. Now, we don't know whether that's true in people, right? But we do know that people are genetically diverse and we absolutely know that genetic background influences the way individuals respond to diet. But it's even worse than that in people because while we're genetically diverse, we're far more environmentally diverse and nobody has really studied the impact of environment on these different dietary interventions. So I say that not not because I think, you know, that means that we should just throw our hands up and eat whatever we want and be unhealthy, but because I think it's important again, to appreciate that, you know, beyond maintaining a healthy weight with these dietary interventions, we really don't have a good understanding of how, you know, a very specific nutritional paradigm is going to work in any given person. We're starting to get there. We're starting to get some of these biomarkers like the epigenetic clocks that I alluded to, which are crude right now. But that's, I think, where we really need to go. We really need to go deeper into having um, biomarkers that are relevant for health outcomes in order to predict personalized strategies for, for optimal longevity. So, you know, there's the basics, maintain a healthy weight, exercise regularly, you know, there's a few other things we could probably put in that basic set, but once you get beyond that, we really need to figure out how do we, how do we personalize 
these different lifestyle strategies to give people the, the best chance at a long and healthy life. Because right now we don't have a very good understanding of that. So, and I think, you know, I think it's important and, and it kind of surprises me how um, easily some people will extrapolate from mouse studies, even with something like caloric restriction or intermittent fasting and make general recommendations to the public and just sort of ignore the fact that 30% of the mouse backgrounds are harmed by this intervention and start saying, oh yeah, everybody should do this. I think that's a mistake. I think we need to be more careful. <laughs> we need to be careful in general, jumping from mice to people, but in particular, when the intervention you're, you're promoting shortens the lifespan of 30% of the genetic backgrounds where it's been tested, you need to be really careful about making recommendations that the general public should adopt that intervention. Yeah, I think that's that's a crucial point to, to leave this podcast on that we shouldn't be extrapolating or jumping too far ahead of what the data actually shows. And there's a lot of work still to be done. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming onto the channel. I'm sure the viewers really enjoyed it and can't sure. wait to have you thanks. on again. Thanks for having me.